California is going to go to jail here in a few minutes. Not in a few minutes, but he's going to plead guilty to collecting lies and hiding campaign funds. Partly using the campaign money to buy different extramarital affairs. Uh, <laughs> only five that we know of. His name's Hunter Duncan from California. And the amazing thing is all this stuff came out and he was so reelected. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So with that, where do we finish here? Did we get to... Popular field of the Oh, we're field of Missouri compromise, popular sovereignty. And I don't have a slide. I want everyone to write down this. Oh, so that was the Kansas-Nebraska. What senator from Illinois came up with the Kansas-Nebraska? Uh, Stephen Douglas. Um, he wanted a northern route for what? Railroad. Trans Continental Railroad, and that just basically meant connecting the Eastern Railroad to the Pacific. Don't think coast to coast. There's going to be a railroad that's going to start somewhere in Ohio or Nebraska and go. And what were the people that tried to overthrow free governments in Latin America, Central America, so they become slave states? And that would become unlimited debate in what body? Senate. Yeah, the Senate. And who was elected president in 1852? Democrat, Franklin Pierce. yeah, Franklin Pierce, one of, if not the drunkest American president. And that's saying a lot. Andrew Johnson, wow, and Nixon would walk around drunk and talk to pictures of former presidents as he's getting near being impeached. So with that, Nixon. so with that, oh, what's the name of a northern Democrat that supports the South? Do you remember that? Uh, Conference during the Civil War, Dole faces them. And everybody write down this, and what happened out of Kansas, Nebraska, write down bleeding Kansas. And it was a civil war in Kansas. All along the border, the edge of the uh, New Kansas Territory and Missouri, because it's going to be open to slavery. By the way, that means the area your city was open for slavery for five years. No, nobody brought slaves up here for slaves to come up here, but it was technically open to slaves. But, leading camp, civil war that would go on from 1854 all the way to 1865. So once Kansas-Nebraska happened, the war is gone. In fact, one political party would literally just disappear. What party? Yeah, the Whigs. You know, think about it. Six years earlier, they had elected a president, and now in 1854, they're gone. It was that fast. In Kansas, the Free Star Leaders were called, you can see it right there, Jayhawkers. Jayhawkers was the name given to Free Star Leaders, and that they had a militia. They would fight this guerrilla war against pro slavery people. Here is a Jayhawker right here. Most of them were masters in disguise in guerrilla warfare. They were red leggings, so they're called red legs, but brutal guerrilla war. And so that's why Kansas is called the Jayhawk State. And the mascot of the University of Kansas are the Jayhawks. It comes from that. And pro-slavery people were called border ruffians. And they would cross over from Missouri, which is right there in the slave state, because there are always more free soilers. And this shows a bunch of border ruffians getting into the Kansas election to pick their constitution. Because in Kansas, when they would pick their constitution, how would you know if someone's from Kansas or not, especially in 1855? So, border ruffians. For years, the camp, University of Kansas versus the University of Missouri used to be just almost a violent sporting event. Like football and basketball. They called it the border war. There'd be fights in the bleachers and all that. Now, they're in different conferences and it doesn't matter, which is kind of sad. I want more violent basketball games. But, pro And in 1856, border ruffians and other pro-slavery people went to the free soil town of Lawrence, Kansas, and burnt much of it down, including, this is the Free Soil Hotel. They took great glee in burning it down. Now, it was a horrible, lawless attack, but pro-slavery people were not targeting, or were not trying to kill free soilers. But free soilers started pushing pictures like this and see them basically executing you see the father and the mother and the kids. They said it was a massacre. Now it wasn't. It's a lawless, horrific act to try to intimidate free soilers. 
But you can imagine how news would spread. So this sack of lards was a big deal in two ways. First off, in just two days before this happened, remember the telegraph, now they get information almost immediately. On the floor of the United States Senate, Charles Sumner would give a speech to the crime against Kansas, berating border ruffian activity of intimidation and attacking free soilers. And in it, Sumner, by the way, you'll notice the new party initial, created out of Kansas, Nebraska, the Republicans. He was a Whig and abolitionist, like this picture of him. Notice his fist, trying to go back to the that fight. You know, fighting for freedom. He mentioned Admiral, ba Admiral Butler. Andrew? Abru? From South Carolina. He was a Whig, but he became a Democrat. By the way, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around that picture. I can't quite figure out what he looks like. Yeah, and the weird expression he has. But he attacked him as a liar, which is technically violating Senate rules. Then the sack of Lawrence came. And the very next day, Butler's cousin, Preston Brooks, whose nickname was Bully, he wanted revenge, as he saw for this personal attack against the dignity, against their family. He wanted to come back, so he carried his cane into the floor of the United States Senate. Now, the Senate then, the old Senate chambers, was about the size of this room. And as the country got big, bigger, senators were just packed in. They're remaking the Senate chambers at this time. The Senate chambers now are being made. As if they're just laying down the foundations when this happened. But... It was so tight that the desks were all really small and had to be bolted in. So they couldn't move it because it would cover up the aisles and no one could get around. So think about these little desks. Sumner was on an aisle because he was, he was over six feet tall, pretty big, and could hardly fit in the desk. So he had to be on an aisle. Brooks told his friends what he was going to do, and the gallery was full. See that little viewing area of his friends. We're all like, yeah. And almost all of them were armed. Many are members of Congress. And Brooks walked in with his walking cane. I'm looking for a volunteer. It's for the cause. Thank you. Okay, so now act like you don't know this is coming. And then you'll find So he walked in without warning, but they should have known because everyone back stood up. And they all kind of, basically, it was one of these kind of a sound where everybody, oh no. And he walked in. Sumner was facing forward. And he walked in and said, You have brought disrespect to my family. Prepared to defend, and just as he said it, he started raining blows across his head, knocking him off while well, blood started going everywhere. Sumner tried to get out of his desk and rip the bolts out and then toppled to the ground, and Brooks just kept beating him. Members of the Senate tried to get up to rush to his aid, and Southerners grabbed their cane and held him back. In the gallery, all of Brooks' friends started chanting, beat him, beat him, beat him. So you ready? We'll do it in real life now. Tell me a rule. Now, the thing about it is, is that he nearly killed Sumner. Sumner would be bedridden for over four years. In fact, he's beaten so badly that it appears as though spinal fluid was coming out of his nose. By the way, if spinal fluid comes out of your nose, see a doctor. So with that, that's, I figured that one out myself. But he's a senator. He's a member of Congress. Congressmen can basically do anything. Congressmen cannot be arrested. They only have to follow Senate or House rules. So he's not arrested for merely murdering a man. They're not held to the same laws. So technically, a member of the House or Senate can commit any crime they want to the Senate. There's a logic to it. So let's say the president, who remembers that he carries out the laws, can't have a political opponent arrested in the House to get bills things out. So they can't be intimidated, but you might get things like attacked on the floor of the United States Senate. His admirers would send him thousands of new what? Yeah. And he'd be kicked out of Congress, sent back. Actually, I think he was held in their jail. There was a jail in Congress. The House has a little jail, which is a little room, but the Senate has one to this day where they can arrest and put people in there. The Senate can arrest. The only, only the Senate can do it, not the actual authority. 
and he was sent right back. Well, I didn't sent right back to his old seat. To Northerners, this proved that Southerners were brutal, horrific slave hunters, slave moguls. We're going to destroy the country, a bunch of bullies. What did he like about Sumner? Sumner attacked his cousin. What do you mean attacked? Named him in the speech of a crime against Kansas. Okay. And this is one of the most famous cartoons about this. Here is, okay, Southerners really play this idea that they were the real gentlemen, chivalry. While the Northerners were a bunch of money grubbers. Yet here is attacking that Southern chivalry, argument versus clubs. And that's Brooks. And you notice Sumner with the quill. So he wrote a speech. This is the crime against Kansas. And you can see him holding back people. And then here are people cheering him on. I love this guy. <laughs> but that's actual King. It's in a bank of all things in Boston. So we're going to go to the bank. I can't remember the exact name. I got to look it up again. It was years ago when I went there. But it's the king. And this infuriated Northerners who had enough of bullying. The day after this, hearing about it in newspapers, remember now with Telegraph, they could hear it. This man would be infuriated. That is the picture on the rotunda of the Kansas Capitol. This painting, even though he looked nothing like this. And who is that? John Brown, an abolitionist who believed that all men were equal and saw it as his duty to fight slavery, went to Kansas to fight with the free soilers. In fact, this is closer to what he looked like at that time. And for at least six years, that was my yearbook book. I got that picture in until parents complained. So if you go to the library and they have all the old yearbooks, if you go look at the 2000 Temple of one, that's my picture. Yeah, they complained because they're like, they actually did complain and said, we want to know what our, our, our kids' teachers look like. And not one that put in a picture of, I swear to you, more than one said, of Abraham Lincoln. Oh, no, that's John Brown. So I'm, i got to get it back. That is a good picture, right? And the likeness is kind of can't. But John Brown wanted to take the law in his own hands. As he saw those murderers who went to Lawrence, because he thought it was a massacre. They need to be punished, and the government won't because they're all pro-slavery. So he found five free soilers, actually in a couple cabins. They might have been involved in the sack at Pottawatomie Creek. Just a couple days after the sack, right after he heard about Brooks beating up Summer. To his point of view, even on the floor of Congress, Southerners cannot be stopped. And they took five men out of these cabins along Pottawatomie Creek and butchered them to death with broadswords. Thick, short swords that the army bought didn't work very well. This was a horrific vigilante attack. And by the way, vigilantes are, are um, horrible, lawless. He, try, he actually was, to his point of view, trying to take law in hands. Most vigilantes are just thugs. How many people did he say? Five. And it's great that in, in the there's Helena's known for vigilantes, and they were a bunch of lawless pro-Confederate thugs who wanted the South to win and killed the mayor or governor of Montana. So thankfully, we do nothing to honor them like having a parade or uh, or maybe even name a school their mascot after. Okay, so moving on. Yeah. I don't like video ads. But he did it. That's a picture of him also in 1854. But three months later, at Osawatomie Creek, I'm not making this up. That's why I put the banner show that I'm not making it up. Let's make up another funny sounding name. Osawatomie. At Osawatomie Creek, Brown and other three soldiers, including I think five or six of his 17 sons, he, two wives, one died in childbirth, but still, and they fought off border rough. And so John Brown became one of the most polarizing figures in American history to this day. Was he the brutal monster, Potawatomi Brown, or the tireless fighter for freedom and liberty, Osawatomi Brown? To the South, you can imagine what he was. John Brown would flee with the most wanted man in America, would grow a beard, and go to the burnt over district of New York. We will come back to Brown. Because while this is going on, Kansas 
has a constitutional right. And this has become a crisis because there are two competing constitutions and they have to have an election. The Lecompton and Topeka Constitution. Now, I'm going to let you use your incredible skills of deduction to see if you can figure out which one was the pro-slavery one. Uh, you see, uh, you figure out. They each had a flag that represented the Constitution. Uh, you guess. Which one's the free soil? It's hard. You have to look into the fine, intricate parts of the map of the flags. The thing was, border ruffians were crossing over, and this had to be administered by the federal government. They were doing nothing to stop them. So the first election, the Lecompte one won because free soilers didn't go. This election was clearly wrong. Everyone knew that it was improper. The next election, Topeka won overwhelmingly. No border ruffians came over, and there's a heck of a lot more free soilers. But the doe-faced peers at first supported which constitution? You can guess when I said doe-faced. He supported Lecompte. Even though everybody knew the majority of the people there were free soilers. And so it would rage back and forth, Lecompte Topeka, Lecompte Topeka, for the next four years. Eventually, 1860, it would become a state with the Topeka. But it would still have civil war there until long after the General Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia surrendered. Well past, well into the summer of 1865, they were still fighting in Kansas over this. But Compton to be a horrible, bloody fight. And with this crisis going on, part of the thing that made this so controversial is, oh, here's a good cartoon. Forcing slavery down the throat of a free, free soil. You see it says Kansas right there. And here's Central America and Cuba talking about filibusters. The Democratic platform. So what are the Democrats doing because they want popular sovereignty? Holding his head back, notice how he's tied. And that is Bell, a Democrat, Buchanan, a Democrat, Douglas, a Democrat, and the president, Pierce, pushing slavery down the throat. And the system of slavery is personified. Do you see it? Someone's being lynched. So when you see a cartoon like this, you probably guess, right, you'll get a good idea. But look at the words. It's attacking the Democrats. You see Kansas. These elements tell you, and then murder, help children, help, or help neighbors, help. My, oh, my poor wife and children. So, also out of Kansas, Nebraska, after the Republican Party. The Whigs dissolved. I mean, literally just gone. This started, it depends, probably rip on, rip in uh, Wisconsin, but some people think about it, Michigan. And it's made up of a lot of free soil Democrats. Appalachian is conscious Whigs are like free soil Whigs. And in some ways, they're more concerned about business growth, like tariffs. Remember Clay's American system? But what section of the country would this party in? What section? Mm -hmm. Only in the North. There were no Southern Republicans, which is so weird today, because the Republican Party today is a Southern Party, very much a Southern Party, dominated by Southern politicians. Bob, oh, see that elephant? Thomas Nash drew this cartoon to vote for Republicans because it was a fight for the Union. Steve Rowling, these are New York Democrats, and he drew it as an ele elephant back in 1868. <clears throat> And that's where Republican symbol the elephant came from. Remember, I showed you that cartoon of uh, the jackass hopping around, and Democrats would say, well, "Okay, we'll take it as a working man's donkey." <laughs> we to say now, but remember, it's 1838. That's where the elephant came from. This cartoon right here. So, the ideology of the Republican Party would become, in many ways, the ideology of the North. Now, remember, the ideology is not necessarily fact. Necessarily fact. These are strongly held beliefs that the Republican Party had, and this would become their justification. And get this down, justification to fight this war, fight the Civil War. This is what they thought was worth fighting for. Many Northerners came to believe this. And it's some of the Whig philosophy, but there's remember, there are Democrats, a lot of Democrats in the early Republican Party. Because a lot of Whigs became Democrats. Southern Whigs all became Democrats. So they believed in that concept of free labor. 
this great dynamic system where workers are free to make their choices. But they also emphasize workers' rights, much more than the old Whig Party did. You know, the workers should have the right to try to get better contracts and unionize. Yeah? Why did they, like, why did they use the color red? The what? The color red. For what? For, For everything. Like, the Republican Party? Oh, no, that didn't happen in 2000. Oh, really? Why did that happen? During the election, they used to alternate years blue and red about what states would go to which, which president. But since the election was not settled on election night, they kept showing the maps over and over again. And just by random chance, the networks agreed that the Republicans would be red and the Democrats would be blue. And so they kept showing that over and over again. They started saying the red states were voting for Republicans. And blue states were so that's what it came. Yeah, it just, it just simply because of the television who networks. Won, who, who won that election? The... Um, the Vice President Al Gore won the popular vote, but George W. Bush, Bush won the Electoral College. And it came down to contested vote, contested electors in Florida. And the Supreme Court ruled they're not going to count the votes. They pretty much made Bush. Kind of a good deal. So with that, and they said this system in the North of capitalism, with its very dynamic economy, will provide opportunity. You have so many different options in industry, new farming techniques, business, commerce, transportation. The North has it all, all this opportunity, all this opportunity. All you have to do is show initiative, creativity, work hard, and you can succeed. And that's why Abraham Lincoln was the perfect Republican. Here's guy start out with nothing but through hard work and perfect Republican of 1856. Republican in 1856. Hard work and determination. He was a working man who moved up in the ranks. All you have to do is work hard and show initiative. You have incentive, there's incentives. But in the South, it doesn't matter. No matter how hard you work, when you die, you're going to be probably in the class you started with. Because there's only one chance to become a big plantation owner. You're poor and uh, poor landholder in the South, you're going to die a poor landholder. What your kids going to be, and so on. Now it's more complex. Remember, this is northern, pro-northern, pro-republican ideology. So why work hard in the South? In the South, it stifles opportunity. There's no reason to work hard in the South. That's what the northern ideology was. So that means Southerners were lazy, because if there's no incentive to work, people don't work, and it creates lazy people, and their kids will be lazy, and so on. Don't you want a system that there's hard-working, honest people like the North? Remember, this is ideology. The truth is much more complex than this. But this is a strongly held belief, partially to make Northerners and Republicans feel better. Don't they need money, though? Hmm? Don't like the people in the South need money? Oh, sure. So why but, would... but the thought was, you know, they should get enough to survive in the back. Why show any creativity? Because at the end of the day, you still be in the same place. Well, the North, you show a little bit of initiative, and this is what Republicans were saying. And you can become rich. Now, it's more complex than that, but that's why they are free store. The Republicans are free store because why would you ever want this horrible system? By the way, I didn't mean to do this, but somehow I got the center. That's why I didn't get the weird center. And I look at it like, oh, that's all messed up. That's not what I wanted, but I should have changed it. I didn't. Why would you ever want that system? What's the Southern ideology? Just review. What is that southern ideology that slavery is good and civilizing? Yes. This is the positive. This is the opposite. So while the southerners are more and more saying we have the positive good theory of slavery, and slavery is a good thing, and it civilizes, and it, the country will prosper. If we get rid of it, we'll all be broke, and there'll be murder and vice, and people know their place. Who came up with the positive good theory of slavery? C. Calhoun. Wait, wait, wait. So with that, so in 1856, the Democrats nominated Buck Buchanan. James Buck Buchanan of Pennsylvania. And unfortunately, I know what you're thinking. That Buck Buchanan is not the same Buck Buchanan. That is the Hall of Fame defensive tackle for the Kansas City Chiefs in the 60s and 70s, Buck Buchanan. Now, yeah, he was right. That's him in Super Bowl four, right there. See? This is Buck Buchanan in 1856. I prefer him, but 
for lots of reasons. Now, I'm going to tell you something. And I'm always a little bit nervous when I tell you this because people get so jealous or they start to swoon. He was the most eligible bachelor. Yeah, I know. I know. Oof, yeah. I mean, I'm, I, can't, I, I can't match that. But he was, he was a, the bachelor president. Yes, it was kind of a whispering campaign. I'll let you ponder that one. But he's a Dolphins. Another third party jumped into the race. The American Party, but they were also known as the No Nothings. The No Nothings had a, uh, they nominated former President Miller Fillmore. There was a secret group called the Order of the Star Spangled Banner. If it's secret, it came from that. Members were supposed to say, if asked, I know nothing about them. So that's where the name comes from, the No Nothings. And I know it's kind of weird to think about because by far the most popular music, at least with the cool kids today, is polka. But they actually had polkas back in 1856. Sheet music was a big deal. You buy sheet music and play and sing along the piano. So here's the Know Nothing Polka dedicated to everybody by nobody. Pretty good, huh? Want me to play it? Actually, I wish I had the music for this. I bet it's great. But you all like polka, right? Don't, don't lie. Everyone's into that. I mean, I know we're a little behind the times here in California, but Polk is the thing now. And this party, nominated former President Fillmore, was intensely nativist. And here's a cartoon from 1870, but it fits in that attitude. The promised land seems to go on St. Peter's Rome. Meaning, who's that? The Pope is coming for America by sending all those Catholic immigrants. It was intensely anti-Catholic. And it was vying for that um, second party. The Republicans, we say them and because they would end up winning it electorally, but the know-nothings could have done it. The Republicans <laughs> nominated the bell. Okay, this is real fast, this? I'll see. So it finishes tomorrow after the DBQ. We're going to have to go fast tomorrow. Huh? We'll get to it tomorrow. <laughs> DBQ on well, I'm going to talk about the DBQ tomorrow. Just oh. once again, we talk about how to do it, spend about 15 minutes, and then 